My name is, is Kai Hushka. I work for a group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, we started and are still based out of Pennsylvania, though we have a, a few of us in different parts of the country now, including here in the Northwest. Um, and as Zach talked about, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about coal, but um, really where I'll spend most of my time with is just kind of talking about the underlying structure about who decides, in essence, who decides what your community is going to look like. Is it you and your community or is it somebody else that's deciding? Um, so we're going to look at some of the structural stuff about how that works and what communities have come up against, uh, whether it's been issues around coal or uh, other energy extraction processes or factory farms or corporate water withdrawal. You know, it's, it really ends up boiling down to this question of who decides um, you know, whether that practice goes forward or not. So we'll spend most of our time, so I'm going to kind of lay some things out, um, all coming from our own learning as as an organization uh, over the last, um, I guess, 17 years now. And so as we've been learning, uh, we've been adding more of that information to things. So as we work with community groups, uh, the whole idea is to get other people to understand um, how the broader structure works. Um, because if we feel like it needs to be changed, we have to know what it is that we have to change in the first place. I think what may have pulled a number of you in here tonight is this, this issue about proposals to build uh, shipping terminals here in Oregon. Um, there's also proposals to build such shipping terminals in Washington State, uh, all to uh, give an exit point for coal that's being proposed to be uh, pulled out of the Powder River Basin, uh, Montana and Wyoming, to then ship over to the, to the Far East, China and other countries over there to burn their coal plants for energy. And so there's a number of these proposals being looked at for these shipping terminals, one of them uh, being Coos Bay, others within the Columbia, uh, Longview, Washington is another location, uh, Cherry Point north of Bellingham is another location for one of these shipping terminals. And these are all in the process right now of going through uh, permitting and other evaluation processes, so none of them are actually at the point of being built. Um, but they have uh, definitely uh, awakened a number of folks to um, the issue itself. Um, including the city of Bellingham that um, has uh, actually taken from the stuff uh, that I'm going to share tonight uh, as well as some deeper courses and actually have, have stepped forward to put an ordinance together to try to stop um, the coal trains from coming through their community. Um, that's the basic uh, what's happening um, around the actual coal trains themselves. Um, but really what it comes down to again, as I was talking earlier, is we've got a, a structural issue around that who decides about those coal trains. Uh, and overwhelmingly what we see when it comes to these issues of high importance, uh, it's usually not us in our community actually deciding, but someone else. In large cases it's a corporate interest that's deciding for us, even if we have opposition to something. Uh, and that comes really from how structurally things are set up. And so it's good for us to understand how that structure operates. Um, so that's probably pretty much what I will, will dive into for, for most of the workshop. And again, feel free to ask questions as, as we go, make it as interactive as possible. Uh, a little background on us again, we started in 1995. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're what we call a public interest law firm. We offer free legal services. Uh, so um, once we started doing that, as you can imagine, as community groups, um, you get a lot of phone calls because you're free. <laughs> so, and there were a lot of issues happening uh, at the time we started in rural Pennsylvania. Um, shortly after we started, there was a big influx of factory farms, so large feeding operations coming into Pennsylvania, migrating out of some other states south of there, uh, and wanting to set up shop in Pennsylvania. And we had a number of communities started to call us to say, well, we don't really want factory farms in our community. We're farming communities as it is, but we don't think that that's sustainable type of farming. We want to protect the kind of farming we have. And these corporate factory farms are not something that we want to see. Um, so we started helping these communities, uh, either doing their own legal research, or eventually when uh, the people who founded the organization actually had law degrees and passed the bar and actually could practice law, they started actually defending them from a, from a legal perspective. Uh, we work with about 500 different communities now across the country. Uh, we've been a uh, special legal counsel in about 200 municipalities, just to give some kind of scope of the number of different uh, areas that we've worked in. Um, through our work, both as legal advisors and have, in some cases, sort of community organizers, uh, we've compiled things into uh, a day and a half long or two day long workshop that we call Democracy Schools. Um, I think there's a proposal to host a couple of these in Eugene in September. Um, and this is the curriculum that we go through, it's a 300 page curriculum that we go through in a day and a half. So 
uh, a lot of information, and tonight I'm just going to touch upon a little bit of it. Uh, but the basic idea is to try to get others to understand, unravel, and be exposed to how, in essence, our legal structure and our governmental structure has been set up, and why we're, we're always in this position of trying to fight against things, and then in the end really realizing we don't really have the decision-making power as it stands. Um, so we started working, uh, as I said, mainly with communities dealing with factory farms and also at the same time uh, a large influx of uh, land applied sewage sludge, uh, which has nice names like biosolids. Um, this is basically taking your municipal uh, waste uh, from your sewer treatment plant and actually land applying it. Uh, about 60% or more of it's land applied. A lot of it's actually land applied to farm fields because it's classified as a nutrient. Um, and so this was happening a lot in these rural communities in Pennsylvania. And the, every sort of toxic thing you could think of that gets sent down the drain gets, ends up at these sort of treatment plants. So you're dealing with something that, in a lot of people's view, is, is not very safe to have, especially if you're growing your food in it. Um, so we started working with these communities um, around these issues. And when you start to work in these issues like factory farms, uh, where you invariably end up is around some type of a state regulation around that particular practice. So around factory farms, there's usually regulations that say how is this factory farm going to operate in your particular state. In Pennsylvania, that was the case. So there was a, the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, is the, is the, you know, the state agency that, that monitors, in essence, or regulates the factory farm operations in the state of Pennsylvania. And when we started this work, um, or about the time we started this work, there were actually a number of these communities that had very uh, stringent sort of local regulations around uh, applying sewage sludge to, to land. Uh, enough so that uh, as these factory farms are looking to come into Pennsylvania, they realized it was a barrier to them, that these, these regulations would actually make it uh, expensive for them to operate their factory farms because of the conditions in which these, these communities had placed upon the practice of land applying sewage sludge. Um, so, as the corporate interests do, um, they're not stupid, um, they went to the state legislature and actually passed new law to regulate factory farms. And in Pennsylvania, they passed something called the Nutrient Management Act. Uh, and this became the overarching law that would regulate factory farms. And really, its whole purpose was just to look at how are they going to manage the manure. So, what's your plan? What are you going to do with it? and on all kinds of little uh, items around how much can be land applied per acre and all these other things. But it was really focused on the manure as that being the only thing of which needs to be focused on with the factory farm. And we'll get into an exercise later um, around really the true scope of something like factory farms really is about, in essence, what the community saw factory farms represented versus what the state regulations said factory farms needed to be paying attention to. Um, so, with something like a Nutrient Management Act, it becomes then very uh, clear from a lot of different perspectives about how you have to go about actually confronting the issue. So, as a community group, uh, a group of citizens that are hearing about this factory farm coming into your little town, um, the first place you end up is, is at the Department of Environmental Protection, in Pennsylvania's case, to look at the permitting process. Because with all these kinds of operations, whether it's factory farms or other kind of things, they usually have to file a permit. So that's where the community groups would end up, is with the permit process, or in essence, eventually a, an appeal of the permit itself. And that's where we would step in as a law firm and say, okay, well, we can come and help you appeal the permit. Um, so invariably, the, the permit would be submitted. We would pick up the permit and, in essence, review this thing. Some of them are very large, you know, as large as this book or larger. And you'd go through it, you'd find deficiencies or admissions in the permit. That was the practice, and that still pretty much is the practice of the convention, conventional environmental laws that stands today. And this is what we did. We would look for deficiencies in the permit. And invariably, you would find it. Um, and not because we were expert lawyers. It was just that rarely do these permits ever get looked at or appealed in the first place. So a lot of these slide through even if they have deficiencies because no one actually points them out. So we would go in, we'd find the deficiencies, you'd go in front of the judge, you tell the judge that there's all these different things wrong with this permit, and therefore he can't um, actually uh, call the permit administratively complete. He can't accept the permit as, as complete. In essence, he would throw the permit out. Uh, as the community group who hired us would look at that, they would get all excited. Because, okay, we've stopped, we've stopped this factory farm from coming into our community because now the permit has been thrown out. Um, so there would usually be a party. Um, celebrate the age of factory farms 
and also to put it in the context, if, uh, has anyone been to a factory farm or read about it or seen videos? Or, you have some sense of what I'm talking about here. Yeah. In Pennsylvania, it was 10, 15, 20,000 head hog factory farms. Uh, and in some cases, the communities weren't only getting one of these or two of these, but they were getting upwards of five of these things in their community. And when I say community, I'm talking about townships in Pennsylvania of three or five or 6,000 people. <laughs> so in essence, the hogs were far outnumbering the people. Um, and as you can manage how much manure, uh, you know, a couple tens of thousands of hogs produces. Um, so anyway, there'd be a party celebrating gay in factory farms, um, but invariably it could be a couple of months, could be six months. At some point, the corporation would come back with their corrected permit and they would resubmit. Uh, we would get a call again from the community group saying, hello, hello, red flag, the factory farm corporation is back now, they want a site, you need to come in and do the work that you did last time to find something wrong with it. Uh, and invariably what we would tell them is, well, we, there is nothing else we could do. We would review the permit, any sort of deficiencies that we found the first time had all been corrected. So thereby, that we would exhaust all our legal options within the permitting process um, as, as it stood from a legal perspective. And so invariably, um, the things of which we had set out to help as a environmental law firm, uh, we were now done as far as what we were able to do. So in essence, whatever it was that was proposed was now coming in. Uh, there was nothing left to do within the appeal permit process. And we did this for seven years. I didn't do it, um, thankfully. But the others who did it, um, basically the way that one of our attorneys describes it is it's like Groundhog Day, that movie Groundhog Day, just, mm -hmm. you know, where you're basically reliving the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, because it was all the same process, all the same scenario of what the end result was going to be. And uh, in fact, when it came down to the end of actually stopping to do this kind of legal work, um, we actually had attorneys from the corporate interest coming up to us to thank us for finding the deficiencies and the emissions for the permit in the first place. So we were getting patents on the back from the corporation saying thank you very much for making a better permit for us. Because um, it actually saved them some trouble in case someone else later on looked at it and found some deficiencies in which they wouldn't have to deal with in the future. Uh, we actually saved them a lot of trouble and a lot of time and, and some money. Um, so we were sort of at a crisis point as an organization after doing this for seven years in that we weren't doing what we thought we were set out to do, which was to protect these communities, protect the environment. Uh, we thought it was just uh, a matter of having more lawyers exercising the laws as they stood and that our problem was that if we just had more lawyers, we would have, in essence, a better environment, better community. Um, but we ran up into this sort of Groundhog Day scenario and realized that we were actually weren't doing what we had set out to do. Um, and the reasons why, and we, we do this within our democracy school, we'll do it here tonight, um, we'll kind of do a visual about why that comes to be, in essence, how the regulatory system works. And we're going to use factory farms as our example, but in some ways you can drop about any sort of major issue into this diagram here, and you're, it's basically going to operate the same way. Um, so to start, what we're going to do as a group is um, just sort of throw out ideas about if you live in a community and a factory farm was coming in, you didn't want the factory farm, what might be some reasons about why you wouldn't want the factory farm coming into your community? Suffering on the animals. Animal cruelty? No. You guys can just throw them out. Smell? So. Smell? Yeah. <coughs> Antibiotic resistant disease. Yeah. Air and water pollution. Yeah. Water pollution and air. Yeah. What else? The food that the animals eat a lot of times is GMO and that goes into the product. Hurting small farmers and ranchers. What's that? <coughs> Hurting small farmers and ranchers. Okay. Local farmers. Freight traffic. Traffic. Hurting local ecosystems. Anything else? Producing food that's not healthy. Water availability in some places. <coughs> Anything else? Maybe one more. Monoculture. I think problems 
So we've got a pretty decent list. Um, these are basically the same kind of things that <coughs> these small communities would actually state as being the true situation of allowing factory farm in. So in some ways, you can view it as they had a kind of more complex view of what factory farming actually meant. Um, and so when these things would get proposed, and again, you could take other issues which you feel might be a threat to your community, and you can probably make, again, a very similar list, uh, whether it's maybe natural gas drilling, whether it's sewage sludge, whether it's uh, corporate uh, you know, water withdrawal. I mean, there's, again, you can, as a community, you typically come up with a lot of reasons for why you wouldn't want something like that. So with factory farms, these are the kinds of things that uh, the communities themselves would think about uh, when they were hearing that the factory farms were coming. Um, some of you may know that uh, actually it's now exceeded, I guess, equipment-related death, but suicide is the number one cause of death of small farmers, even in this country. Wow. We hear a lot about it <coughs> in India and other parts of the world, but I think that's the case here. <laughs> so there's, there's that aspect, of course, is the local economy, there's your own private property values, and then, again, there's other things that you get at in the list about why the community wouldn't want it. So, as those things are not okay. What's that? The problems that are listed up there? <coughs> exactly. So they're not they're not part of what in in Pennsylvania's case, because you it's beautiful, because in Pennsylvania you have the Nutrient Management Act. And of course anything and everything that you need to look at around factory farming is all of course contained in the nutrient management act, which of course is really all focused on manure. It's not focused on any of these other things here. So you have the Nutrient Management Act, yet you have a problem statement that is stated by the community, or as us here in this room. And as I mentioned, you have typically you have an agency, so you have a state of some some agency of the state, Department of Environmental Protections, for instance, is who you would go to to understand, well, how do we actually try to keep factory farming out? Well, they would say, well, thanks for calling. Uh, we have something called the Nutrient Management Act, and you can go ahead and challenge the permit as it's being submitted under the Nutrient Management Act. Management Act for the siting of the factory farm. Um, another element uh, is the corporation. Um, you see this more clearly in something like natural gas drilling now, as the drillers are looking for other places to drill. Um, that the corporations end up being also kind of a, a contact point because, in some cases, they're the only ones talking about the activity itself. So, we've got the community meetings that are always held by the corporation. The corporation in the factory farm world of Pennsylvania will tell you the same thing. Well, if you have concerns, you need to go to the Department of Environmental Protection, and you need to look at the Nutrient Management Act, and you can actually, in essence, challenge the permit as the permit is submitted. Another entity of which um, doesn't have a specific name, but we call it um, the culture. So even when we organize our activism, a lot of activism is also driven towards this idea of, well, we have to go to the regulatory system for the regulations around a particular practice, um, you can't, in essence, do anything else. You can't bring all these other things up because it's not allowable. Only whatever's in the Nutrient Management Act is allowable. So even our own cultural mindset says, well, you have to follow the rules, in essence, of whatever has been laid out. Uh, and another thing I didn't mention, in a lot of cases, in most cases, those regulations that have been laid out are usually written by the industry that's going to be regulated. So, and again, you see it most egregiously right now in the, in the drilling world. It's, it's very clearly the oil and gas industry writing the legislation, handing it off to the state legislators who then vote it in and put it in place. And it's all about supposedly regulating their practice. And the reason why we have a triangle here is that all that stuff drives you down to what we call um, a single regulatory point or a single point. And in the case of factory farming, that single point is all about manure. So in essence, it takes what we just described as very, very, very complex, you know, very broad, uh, a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of concerns, a lot of issues of which we as the community consider this issue of factory farming to be about, and it drives us all down to have this discussion about shit, about manure, um, because that's how the regulations are set. So it drives you down to the single point. And not only does all, all these things drive you down to the single point, but um, when I say us, I mean people like the Legal Defense Fund, when we practiced this kind of law for seven years, we also drove communities down to the single point. Because as a law firm, that's all we were left with, because the law, you have to practice whatever the law says. And so we were left with also using the Nutrient Management Act to somehow protect these communities. But invariably, all we were doing was driving people also down to the single point. In essence, all these other issues could never be argued 
because in essence, as you were saying, they're not part of the law itself. So the law is all about whatever is within the Nutrient Management Act. So our whole job was to find efficiencies within the permit as described within the Nutrient Management Act. And everything else is in essence non-existent. It doesn't exist under that, uh, that, that law itself. And the other reason we draw this in this manner is not only to show, in essence, the basic summation of how the regulatory system works, but also in some ways to show what happens to communities. So in essence, if this is the community, like cattle, you get driven down a chute, and guess what happens when you get to the end of the chute? Well, you get the bolt to the head. And that's invariably what happened with all these communities we were helping, is we actually helped them, we helped drive them down the chute, even as a law firm, because we were practicing the laws as it was laid out by something like the Nutrient Management Act that was actually constructed by the, the large corporate agricultural businesses themselves to regulate themselves. So part of why we do this is to show you that it's, it's no surprise we have the conditions we have uh, because of the way that we allow things like regulatory law to be written and actually who's writing that law. So this is a lot of what, again, we did. This was our Groundhog Day scenario. And again, you can drop just about any issue into it and it's going to operate fairly similarly. Now there might be different layers of permits. There could be a federal permit, there could be a state permit. <coughs> the basic premise is you are, in essence, running into this regulatory system, which the regulatory system is about allowing something to happen. It's about regulating it. I mean, if you break the proper word, it's never about saying no to it. And then within the regulations, you have permitting, which is about permitting something again to happen. Or in a lot of cases, when it comes to big issues, it's about permitting a, permitting a level of pollution. In essence, legalizing a certain amount of pollution, saying it's okay if we pollute this much, because now it's part of the regulatory scheme. It's legal. So it's all about using law in order to push the practices through, which we've done as in time of memoriam as human beings. We've always legalized whatever it is that we wanted to validate. And so that's why we legalized slavery, because we validated it under the law. It wasn't just about the violence and suppression of people for the sake of doing so, but we actually legalized it. And so we still have that same condition now, especially around environmental stuff, where it's the law, and we have regulatory law in essence to manage it. Um, but we're allowing it, we're permitting a certain amount of pollution to happen. Which is also another reason to look at, when we look at major environmental indicators, you know, we're not doing very good. In fact, in most cases, we're doing worse than we were doing 40 years ago. And so when you look at, okay, we're in worse shape than we were 40 years ago, except we think we're under a rule of law that's been about protecting the environment, and that's not what it's been doing, maybe we need to look at the system itself around how it's been working, or unless it's not working from our perspective, and maybe start to think differently about what it is that we have to do differently. I'm going to stop there for a second. Any questions? Good timing. <coughs> Again, we, in our democracy school, we spend a lot more time getting to this point. So this might seem pretty rapid, pretty rushed, um, especially if you haven't been involved, let's say, in a permit appeal or have been involved in a certain group that's trying to fight something. It all may be kind of new and foreign and different to you. So I apologize for that. We don't have a whole lot of time tonight. So trying to get at least some of the general things out there. And, um, like I said, the, the, the democracy schools take more time to get to that point and get some more background. Sort of into it a little bit more instead of just throwing it into the defense.